What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back. Today's episode is going to be brought to you by Mystery Ranch, built for the mission. If you haven't been rocking a Mystery Ranch backpack for your fire career, well, that sucks to be you, dog. Yeah, your back probably hurts. Anyways, Mystery Ranch is obviously known for making the best damn pack in the Wild Empire game, the most comfortable and the best warranty, hands down. However, you still got to take care of your stuff. I just recently saw some like stuff from the pictures of the graveyard packs that have been coming back to uh, the. Uh, the ranch over there in Bozeman and uh, y'all need to t- start taking better care of your shit. Just saying. Anyways, mystery ranch is actually known for their direct relationship with the boots on the ground. And that's actually how that pack that you're probably wearing is actually been designed and developed and put into the field. Basically they actually are uh, taking notes from folks like you in the field and feeding it up to the chain to the design team and then making a product out of what your feedback is, what your needs are. So without a little bit of feedback, well, they can't make bitching stuff. So by all means, reach out to them and say, Hey, you ever thought about doing this? Or, Hey, have you ever thought about making something for this? They actually take a little input quite well. In fact, Dana went down to uh, SoCal and tied in with some shots down there. And that's actually another reason why that, uh, hot shot pack is on your back and now is designed the way it is. Why do they do this? Well, because they give a shit. They give a shit so much that actually they're giving away thousand dollar scholarships for those folks in the field that are looking to up their game and actually try and uh, expand their horizons as far as education or stuff that's going to benefit their fire career. How are they doing that? Well, they're doing that with the Mystery Ranch Backbone Series and it's awesome. So if you have an awesome story about Wildland Fire and you want to share it with the world and share it with Mystery Ranch, go over to www.mysteryranch.com and check it out because these, uh, scholarships that are up for grabs, well, they have an expiry date and that is going to be May 31st. So end of this month is your deadline to get all your stuff turned in. Once again, that is www.mysteryranch.com. Go check them out. The Anchor Point Podcast is also brought to you by our homies over at Hotshot Brewery. It's kick-ass coffee for a kick-ass cause where a portion of the proceeds will always go back to the Wildland Firefighter Foundation. So if you're looking for some kick-ass coffee for a kick-ass cause, well, go over to www.hotshotbrewing.com and you can check out their full line of coffee. But also they have a full line of all of the tools of the trade to get your morning started off right, like arrow presses and pour overs and cups and all that jazz. But they also have a full line of wildland firefighter themed apparel. So if you're looking for one of those unskilled laborer shirts or hell, even if you're looking for an anchor point tee, one of those uh, elusive anchor point podcast shirts, well, they also have those too. Go over to www.hotshotbrewing.com and check it out where you can get all of your kick kick-ass coffee for kick-ass causes in one place. Yeah. Hot shop brewery. They're awesome. Check them out. The Anchor Point Podcast is also going to be brought to you by my homie booze over at The Ass Movement. And if you don't know what The Ass Movement stands for, well, that is going to be the anti-surface shitting movement. And it is a hilarious cause. It's kind of like a, I don't know, a happy music over sad news. Anyways, it's shining light on the turd problem that is uh, plaguing our uh, wild, beautiful, scenic surroundings in public lands. And that is so disgusting and that shit needs to stop. So if you want to help spread the poo bearing propaganda, go over to www.thefirewild.com and check out the ass movement where you can get 10% off your entire order site wide. <gasps> Ooh, how do you do that? You might ask. Well, if you want some of this poo bearing propaganda, all you got to do is throw some stuff in your cart and at checkout, you just enter the code anchor point ass 10 at checkout and bing, boom, done. You got 10% off your entire order. Once again, go over to www.thefirewild and check out the ass movement booze. You are my homie. And yeah, you definitely carried, uh, the balance of the load there uh, during that whole TED talk thing that we did down here at the uh, the uh, preseason meeting for the Bureau of Land Management. So just want to say thanks, homie. And last but not least, the Anchor Point Podcast is, well, they're not sponsored by, they're not brought to you by, but it is one of those close relationships I have with Bethany over there at the American Wildfire Experience. And uh, yeah, I just want to show her some love for as long as I possibly can because I believe in her cause and I believe in her mission and she's got some rad stuff going on. And if you don't know what the American Wildfire Experience is, well, they house the Smoky Generation. And I know for a fact, a lot of people out there have seen that rolling around. It's pretty freaking awesome. What it is, is basically a digital storytelling platform uh, telling the story of wildland fire. There's 
quite literally, there's, there has to be like over 250 of these stories out there now, but it's preserving the legacy of the uh, folks in the field and the story of wildland fire. And some of these stories even date back to the 1940s. It's pretty freaking bitching. So if you want a little history lesson, or if you want to sign up for the Smoky Generation grant program, if you got a compelling story and you're telling the story of wildland fire through the lens of a camera, a video camera or a still camera through a blog, through some animations. There was this one dude out there who made uh, We Move Mountains with Spoons and it's freaking kick ass and they're a Smoky Generation grant recipient. Yeah, sky's the limit. Tell the story. It's freaking awesome. Anyways, if you want to find out more, go over to www.wildfireexperience.org and you can check it all out. Once again, www.wildfireexperience.org. Bethany, you have a kick-ass organization over there. Keep it up. The views and opinions of this podcast do not reflect the views and opinions of the United States government, the Department of the Interior, the Department of Defense, the Department of Agriculture, the United States Forest Service, the Bureau of Land Management, National Park Service, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, or any private, municipal, county, or state firefighting organization, any law enforcement agency, any medical provider, or any contractor employed by any federal agency. What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to another episode of the Anchor Point Podcast. So today we are going to be continuing our little series. Uh, there's going to be about four more of these uh, from the Bureau of Land Management State uh, meeting, the preseason meeting. And uh, yeah, uh, I'm going to be the first to admit it, but I don't think I give enough uh, love to the engine programs that are out there in the uh, fire world. So we're going to have them on the show today. We're actually going to be talking to a bunch of captains and a uh, fire operations tech, and I believe is the new title for it, the fire operations tech. It's kind of like a mini FOS or a FOS. Anyways, long, long story short, we got a bunch of folks that are going to be talking all about the engine program unique to the state of Nevada, including some of those heli operations that you don't really see too much of in other places. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce four of my good friends. And their names are going to be Austin Lee, Truett Anderson, Elliot Krinka, and Chris Weaver. They are scattered all around the uh, Bureau of Land Management stations across the uh, state, but they are here to inform you about the engine program. And I am a little bit biased when I say this, but it is pretty badass. I will say that. So, ladies and gentlemen, buckle up. Welcome to another episode of The Anchor Point. <laughs> great here we go uh, yeah, it's yeah. too early in the morning for this crap so <laughs> anyways <laughs> ladies and gentlemen welcome back to another episode of the anchor point podcast how's everybody doing this fine morning doing well yeah. doing great nice, nice getting hydrated yeah we uh, <laughs> had a very extreme bowling tournament last night and that went off without a hitch yeah it uh probably was one of the best bowling turnouts we've had in the last well, it was good yeah yeah since 2017 we've been doing it every year oh really Every, yeah, every two years, biannual, whatever that word is. And then, uh, yeah, last night I was actually shocked that that many people showed up to bowl and hang out, have some drinks. Nice, man. Yeah, it was a good turnout. A lot of good, like, I like the way that everybody just came together. We were just, like, hanging out and pounding around. It's cool. It's cool to see that stuff outside of, like, a work context, you know? Oh, yeah. And I think the big thing, like, that I was telling people, it's like, man, COVID, like, we've had the, all these meetings, like, Technically, all these meetings can be done, you know, through the new Zoom way. Yeah. But <clears throat> you finally got to go back and like, oh, hey, let's have a drink. Let's bullshit. Let's have a good time. And then, oh, I haven't seen this guy. You moved up. Like, oh, who are you? And so, yeah, it's definitely changing. Like, I think everybody needed this, especially after COVID. You know, we see each other on fires or something. But like. But that's like the extent of it, though. Yeah. And. And coming in here you're like cool like we're hanging out now like we're family again yeah no it's a good thing man it's uh yeah like on the line i mean it's kind of like a work thing but when you get to actually like mesh and connect i think it's really good it's good for like cohesion you know good for camaraderie good for all that stuff just 
being a human. You know? Yeah. It's good shit. But anyways, we'll go around the table here. Let's introduce ourselves as the BLM engine, I guess, committee. Like you guys are been hand chosen by uh, the state pretty much to be on the show today. Talk all about the Nevada engine program. So Austin started off, man. Yeah. Uh, Austin Lee out of Winnemucca District BLM. Um, Going to be 10th fire season coming up and fifth year running a truck as an engine captain. So happy nice. to be here and yeah, looking forward to chatting with you guys. My turn. <laughs> so my name's Trude Anderson. Um, uh, I'm the fire operations tech for Southern Nevada. This will be my 15th season in Nevada. Um, but yeah, I ran trucks for a very long time. We even worked on, um, Elliot's truck once got yelled at afterwards, but yeah, I am super excited to be here and make sure that my friend Elliot has a good time. <laughs> Yeah, um, my name is Elliot Krinka. I am the fire operations tech for Elko Station. Yeah, I'm the old guy here, I guess. I am on 18 years. 18 years? 18 fire seasons. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Um, it's new to me, so this, this part, so it's going to be exciting, I guess. A little different. Yeah. Nice, man. And you? Yeah, I'm Chris Weaver, uh, Carson City District out of Cold Spring Station, uh, engine captain there. And yeah, going into my 16th season. And I think I might be the only one that's worked for BLM outside of Nevada. Is that true? Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So Nice. How's the running competition with Biddle? His <laughs> knee's been all bummed up, so I haven't really ran with him. That guy's a machine, man. He's running machine. So you're saying you're, you're winning? I mean... I guess, you know, but I'm not. <laughs> you got to take that win now. <laughs> that, that knee might get better. That's yeah. true. Yeah. I'm, I don't consider myself much of a runner to begin with. So we got the upper hand right now. I mean, yeah. you just go like, what was that professional like uh, skater back in the Olympics? <laughs> she like took out the other. The oh, person. yeah. yeah. yeah, like, yeah. I forget her name. But anyways, <laughs> so let's talk all about engines, man. So I was an engine guy for a while here. I started off my career uh, here in Carson City as well. Um, traveled to Stead. I was in Stead. I was in Carson City. I was in Doyle, California. Went and did my apprenticeship thing, did some hotshot time, did some hell attack time, came full circle back to Ely where I met you. We worked yep. with you. And then uh, I'd fill in on the engines. I was on the hell attack crew out there, but I ended my career back here in Doyle, California. And uh, Bronson was my captain. He's uh, in HR now. That that yeah. fool. God, man. That crazy circle. Yeah. Like, it's weird, man. It it blows me away when I see somebody get out of fire. I'm like, <laughs> you do that? It's possible. Like, Wait, <laughs> you can do this? Where's the secret? <laughs> but it's weird, man. It's because I've had the most, like, like, I guess the best times in my career probably in Nevada. I mean, I went to, I got the opportunity when I was in Ely to go over and teach at the academy. And that was one of the times of my life. So luckily I was afforded that. But the engines here in Nevada, I, I think that they're, they're like one of those resources that kind of win the day, especially on initial attack. Cause we have a lot of capabilities out there, mobile attack, and it's the perfect fuel type. Oftentimes the perfect topography, you know, you get out to the flats, you're chasing fire for a hell of a long time. And then if you run into the hill, you just start plumbing hose up the, up the hill, or you can crew up and make a crew out of like these engines that are all dispatched to this fire. Right. So let's talk about like the capabilities and what you guys do, how you guys see it and what you guys see in the future for the engine program here in Nevada. That's deep. It's super deep. Yeah. Um, I can go first. I'll take it a little bit. But uh, Elliot's similar district runs those super heavies, those 668s, you know, so that, that flat rolling fires along the, you know, grass and sage, you know, it's it's direct with those super heavies. Um, where it's going to go in the future with those, I I'm honestly am not sure. They're up for a contract rewrite right now. So we'll see what the equipment shop comes up with next for that specialized next piece of equipment. Um, did some time on a heavy when I first started and been on a super heavy ever since those, uh, six, six, eights. So yeah, this six wheel drive and cruising, you know, either in front of the dozer or behind it, um, uh, getting in the, you're in the stuff. Yeah. So it's fun. So six, six, eight, like the super heavies, like kind of explain what that is, like that package, that engine package. Cause not a lot of people are going to know the like 
the numbers of the models and stuff like that. So a lot of listeners aren't going to be listening to that. They're not going to understand that. So let's talk about like the capabilities of it. Yeah, for sure. So some of the capabilities, you got a six wheel drive, um, two models and ATC Tatra or a Firehawk EX on an Oshkosh chassis, similar to what the military uses. For like the fuel hauling and yeah, fuel haulers, yeah, right? Yep, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Or their crash rescue trucks for the military. But uh, what that looks like is 2,060 gallons of water, 50 gallons of foam, um, single cab, three seats across the front. Air it's ride real comfy seat. real quick. Real comfy. Yep. <laughs> yep. People say asses and elbows and it's true. Um, and you know, it, you got a, wa- a water monitor. Some people like to call it a turret. I like to call it a water monitor um, or just a monitor. But yeah, and you fight for the fire from inside the cab. Um, you know, type three engine. So pumping capabilities there um, with that 2,000 gallons of water. It's it's, uh, it's more of experience and strategy when it comes to how long you can go to, to fight that fire. But uh, they have their pros and they have their cons just like everything else in life. So um yeah, you know, they do uh they do the good work out in Winnemucca and and, and uh, Elko as well, you know, been uh been able to have the opportunity to fight fire in Elko and uh Winnemucca with being on the six six eight. So they do pretty good work. Not only that, but they're pretty damn cool looking too. I gotta say those things are pretty beefy and they they just get some. They can haul ass across the desert and just take pretty much anything you throw at them. So Yeah, they do good work. Um but yeah, I, I'm excited to see what the future holds for those for sure. Especially because they're going to be up for rewrite soon, and yeah, just see where it goes. So I couldn't imagine what one of those tires cost. Um, from Les Schwab, you roughly uh, <laughs> did uh, we say the quiet part out loud here? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's <clears throat> four grand. Yeah, four grand. Yeah. Oh, oh shit! Yeah, that's, uh, yeah. <clears throat> Luckily, we have the connection through DOD. Yeah. So we're able to get those for uh, for a better price, almost you know two for the price of one. So yeah. Luckily, we were able to f- circumnavigate a little bit of you know getting those those tires taken care of through the department of defense. So is it like surplus stuff that you're trying to get through? Like, I don't know, an army depot, like her long or something like that. Yeah. I think it's essentially similar to that. Um, yeah. I don't, our f- fire property and fleet manager usually handles all that ordering. Um, but based off our, you know, annual tire inspections that we do every year, those findings, we just place a bulk order through the DOD and, uh, we're able to get them at, at pretty much their cost. Um, and those tires I believe are, we're under an exemption where they're going to still continue to make them for fire and DOD. Mm-hmm. So we're pretty fortunate to at least be under that exemption and still keep those trucks running. So speaking of the exemptions with those super heavies, man, um, how does it work with like the roadworthiness thing? Like that's got to be kind of a challenge, a unique challenge for like the department of transportation. Like you don't see these things traveling down the road too often. Usually when you see them in a military context, they're on a load boy, like going somewhere. They're not just like cruising along the road. So, right. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's uh, it's a long drive when you're in one for sure. Can imagine uh, it's very, very quick. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've yeah. never operated one, so um, yeah. it's one of those things. Everybody passes you on the road, but once you get off the road, you pass everybody else. <laughs> so it's it's kind of one of those things, you know. They they off they off road so much better than than driving on the road. But uh, you know, you get there when you get there. Um, the primary goal is getting there safe. You can't fight the fire till you're there. So biggest thing is, you know, we're going to take as long time as much time as we need. Um, to get on scene safely and, and get after it. So, oh, yeah. yeah. Speaking of, uh, handling off-road capabilities, I, I've heard like rumors about these things, like being able to just haul ass through brush, through washes, through rocks, through gnarly right. stuff. It's like practically a, I don't know, a, a semi version of a trophy truck. Like what's it, the speed capabilities of these things in like the desert crushing brush? Yeah. I mean, uh, if you're on the Tatra with the air ride suspension versus that, uh, that <laughs> coil suspension, the Tatra, you f- it just floats. It feels like you're on a boat on, on glass water. It floats really well. Um, especially if you've got the air ride seat, Mm -hmm. I mean, you could probably go 40, 45, 50, um, off road, you know, if, especially if you're on like a designated two track, um, you know, you're cutting through vegetation or whatnot, you know, you, you go a little slower just cause you're not trying to break it. Yeah. But, uh, they, they do good work, uh, drainages, all that fun stuff. It's, it's one of those things you don't get tossed the keys and say, go drive it. Um, it's definitely one of those things that you learn the capabilities as you drive it. Um, but yeah, they, they, it does awesome work once you really get comfortable with operating one. So it, it's pretty cool. Like I rode in the Tatra with Elliot, um, which that was pretty wild, but you, like when you're in there, you're like, okay, like we're cruising. This is all right. But when you're not inside that thing and you're watching them mob through, you're like, what are they do? Cause that thing is just rolling. But when you're in there actually squirting water you're like okay like this is actually pretty good like i don't feel all these bumps 
but I know that what it looks like on the outside. Like, I don't want to get back in there. Yeah, you got to be careful because you can take those things where you don't want to go. Yeah, you could probably get yourself into a corner real For quick. Sure, there's a estimating like the capabilities, maybe. <clears throat> yeah, there's a reason there's a separate class just for that truck mm -hmm. that you have to take. It's not like your standard engine academy. No, there's yeah. an extra six six eight class that you have to take to drive that. Okay, so, um, that's the reason because you can definitely get yourself into some trouble if you don't know what you're doing with those trucks. Yeah, I couldn't imagine that it's very maneuverable in tight spaces. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah they're a <laughs> <laughs> They're a straight up, straight down kind of truck. Um, it's a real top heavy, so you just got to be be careful where you're taking those things. Gotcha. So side hill and it's out of the question. It's not like a Unimog. It's not out of the question, but you just got to be, you know, <laughs> just going to be you aware be of what's going on there. What you're doing. Gotcha. Sure. Yeah. Nice, man. So what about some other machines that we have out there? I know we rely heavily on type threes and fours. We got the special uh, Tatras and six, six, eights, you said? Yeah. The, yeah. the, just the Oshkosh is the kind of the term that we run by. So. Okay. And that's where everything's going to is the Oshkosh. Tatras out of there mm -hmm. and everything's going to the Oshkosh, Oshkosh. So is it just because of operational expense for the Tatras? I mean, I couldn't imagine those things are cheap to run, but neither is an Oshkosh. Yeah. So we're still running um a tatra it's we still got one but uh it was used in the Czechoslovakia military as a missile carrier so yeah <laughs> wait what <laughs> yeah so they were they used them as a, a missile carrier mm -hmm. in the czech uh, republic but they uh they getting parts for that truck is very difficult yeah um there's one specialist out in uh, idaho where we can take it and he's he's awesome with them but uh you know we we had a Biggest thing is like, don't break a windshield. Well, <laughs> following, you know, a dozer transport down the road, doing what we do, you know, cruising down a, a dirt road at fairly good speeds. One of the duels kicked up a rock, broke the windshield. Darn. Shit. So I think the, uh, we ended up ordering two windshields, you know, cause you break one, you try to get two just in case it ever happens again, especially with that truck. And I think it took eight months to get the windshield. Oh, wow. Did it put your engine down for like... DOT stuff or we were able to have a local windshield company at least just kind of put a patch on it so we could keep running and doing the good work. But uh yeah, the parts are very slim pickings when it comes to that specialized equipment. And luckily the Oshkosh is a little easier getting parts. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, it's it's that's kind of I think why they, the big push was to phase those out and come up with the next best thing. Nice. Okay. Yeah. So what about the type three program? Let's just work our way down to by type. So type threes, that's what I got the most experience on type threes and fours type threes, the most experience on. I was running an interface package with, uh, what was that like a, I want to say it was a BME interface engine, 500 gallons, you know, tons of gallonage, but you got to have a hydrant cause you don't have shit for water. Yeah. <clears throat> no water. I, man, like I, I hate type threes so much. Like, yeah, the pump is better, but like, you got less, but now, I mean, I can't remember. I haven't really paid attention, but like, we're still carrying a lot of water, but we live in Nevada. There's, <laughs> there's no water here except for the hydrant. Newsflash, it yeah. is a desert. <laughs> and so that's why I, I'm, I think it's great, especially if we go other places when we help out, but man, in the state, like just give me a four or type six, like I'm really against the threes, but they're great. I think now it's getting better because we're, we fought for so many years in that, in the programs that like, those trucks were single cabs to extended cabs. And now it's like, Hey, like now we four need, door. they're four door. They're a little ugly, but there's more room for the guys. And like, people are starting to realize like we needed that, like give us some space. They do look a little bit like a garbage truck now. I'm not going to lie, but they serve its purpose. Like you can almost, I, my short ass could stand up in the back of one of these. Oh yeah. Ones. So yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, the type threes, man, I mean, yeah, out in like a majority of Nevada, except for around like, exclusively washoe county pretty much and maybe some of the outlying areas like maybe elko you have some interface out there of course around your towns that's where like the type threes really shine that's what they're built for interface right wild intermittent interface great i was here so yeah made the most sense to have a type three out here i mean yeah we do get you know out into the weeds yeah they have but, their purpose like here they work great i mean other places like eh. yeah you can't to go off road very well they don't turn as good as like a type six would, but like, yeah, the, I mean, I just don't like the type threes. Like, but I also, I have always had the older ones. Yeah. So like, I'm just there to retire the trucks. All right. <laughs> See you later, bud. <laughs> and then to go order and wait about three years to get a new one. Dude, it is yeah. insane. Well, the nice thing is now that 
you know, our, we're, when we are able to replace these type fours, these older models, we can put that type three pump in there yeah. and still have the 750, 800 gallons of water. You just swap out. So it's practice. basically they're type threes, but you know, we're calling them type fours. So we have the pump capabilities of a type three. And I mean, we could call them type threes because, because of that walls, pump. Yeah. But, but yeah, we're leaving the labels where they are with the type fours, but the capabilities there. So yeah. that's nice that we are able to do that. Should we just start calling them the three and a halfs? Yeah. <laughs> type three and a half engines. Yeah. Yeah. So, I was, I was going to say like all of the new ones we're getting are the exact same and we're just labeling them as type threes, you know, you're but, switching the label. No, or, I mean, you guys or, like the, you know, the ones you guys got in Elko yeah. over the last couple of years are the same ones yeah. that they got yeah. over they're in not Carson. Six, six fives. Right. No. It's just still the, yeah. yeah. Um, and they're just, yeah. I mean, it, it, unless I'm missing something, yeah, they're the same capabilities and gallonage and everything, but. Yeah, I mean, I actually run the truck that you were on. Two four. Out of, yeah, take care of my baby, man. Don't that, break her. She's been down for nine months. <laughs> what did you do to my girl, man? You I, left. Yeah, <laughs> dude, I don't know what happened, man. We drove back from Colorado. Check engine light came on in Utah in June, and uh, then the the engine blew on July fourth. Sat, <laughs> sat at the uh, <laughs> sat at the shop for nine months. Got it back and the auxiliary power panel went out. So it's just been one thing after another on that truck. But I will say with that old engine, uh, the <laughs> things that I noticed was it's got like electrical ghosts. I swear to God, it's like you're chasing well, fucking wiring harnesses. They've manifested day. into everything. Cause yeah. it's not just electrical anymore. That thing's yeah. Yeah. It's a little rough. Ones are mean, man. Yeah. They just <laughs> take away those trucks. Well, it, and it sat for two years without, you know, consistent, uh, use. So I think they had time to just fuck around. So you know, get everything all messed up, but <laughs> yeah, really in. get in there. Yeah. So pack rats got into there and started chewing up stuff. But I mean, it's interesting. Cause like from the interface, like that was my first time on a truck like that. Mm -hmm. You know, I've ran, um, you know, kind of the traditional Nevada type threes and fours, um, otherwise. And so, uh, my assistant and I, like we tore everything out of that truck that was interface and made it a desert truck. Yeah. Cause I'm like, I fight fire in Nevada, you know, I don't need to carry a snap tank i don't need to carry three miles of hose yeah like i got hose packs like you know i'm gonna respect the terrain that we're in and the way that they fight fire in carson versus maybe elko but you know like i want to be prepared to fight fire in nevada not to you know um have all this stuff because you know i'm trying to fit what the the mold of the truck was so yeah um so hopefully once it's back up and running we'll actually get to try that out and see, <laughs> see if it, see you it know, works <laughs> works so yeah so there was a lot of outside pressure when I outfitted that thing and, uh, Bronson and I were in charge of that, that engine, we outfitted it to where we could easily go to California. Cause we often like previously, I don't know if it's changed a lot, but we'd be finding ourselves in California all the time. So whether that's either, you know, her long or something close with where we're at in Doyle or going over here. So we had to have like the way I was kind of looking at outfitting that thing was a little bit of versatility to mm -hmm. be able to go to California set up a tank, blah, 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 blah. But there was, I will say some, some bullshit on that <laughs> that I had to put on there. And I just kept it. It's like, I don't know where I'm going to store this. So I might as well just keep it on there. And there were some also outside pressures about outfitting that thing. Did it need three miles of hose? No. <laughs> like the amount of hose that was on there, probably when you took over, it was a lot, right? Yeah. But I mean, like 16 hose packs on there. Oh, some crazy And we shit. still have all the hose packs and yeah. everything. I mean, we just, yeah, we, we tried to just make it where, you know, it's not just an interface truck. Like we can interface, but then like, I don't know. I, and last year was crazy slow on the Carson city yeah. district, you know? So like, it's slow statewide. Yeah. 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 Like, Nationwide. Really? I mean, we burned 83 acres on district. That's last it. Year. Yeah. Eight, three, yeah. not 830. Nope. Eight, three. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Vegas had more acres burned than Winnemucca two years ago and then you guys last year. So yeah. I find that really, really hard to believe because Vegas hardly ever burns. <laughs> yeah. I know. <laughs> yeah. It, it's crazy how slow it was up here. Yeah. Yeah. Talk about going stir crazy, man. Yeah. But yeah, man. So outfitting these engines, let's talk, look, well, let's get back to the other type. Let's, uh, let's talk about the type sixes. You don't see too many of those in Nevada, but they do serve a good utility, especially with getting into like back in some, steep shitty canyon you can get close and then start hiking right yeah and so like i know the most i probably hear about type sixes because you guys have all been on the 
I eighty mafia area. <laughs> uh, I eighty hot laps all summer. Yeah, probably. but uh, so like those type sixes, like Ely District, they have a bunch, mm-hmm. and then Southern Nevada, we've got two right now, and those things are amazing. They're quick. You can get it's driving your truck off road. Yeah. It's an F what yeah. five fifty. Yeah, it's an F five fifty. You got three hundred gallons of water. It's like two seventy five or something like that. But you don't have enough water to do anything. But if you actually know how to use that equipment, like you can hang and go with those heavies for a while. Oh yeah. And like, that's the one cool thing. Like you can do really good hot, hot, you know, here we go. Let's go have some fun. But then, Hey, get back. But we're faster. Like we can go get a a water source way quicker. Oh yeah. And so that's the coolest thing that I love about these type six is like they're quick. Personally, I think we should just get a word of everything above the type six. like whoa, we whoa, just whoa, pump the brakes, like man. Every <laughs> my two twenty-two or two four rather. Elliot has heard this as well. Um, there's been, you know, like trying to get the CDLs and all that. Like, there's a new change for that in the state. So, like, okay, let's just get rid of heavies all together. Just give everyone type sixes, and we don't got to worry about the CDL requirements and all that. Like, it'll it'll cure. You know, it won't help. Then us. you're gonna have to order twenty, 20 water tenders. Yeah. This is blasphemy. Get out. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you take that up with my bosses about I just know. going type sixes. I, I didn't know. realize this was such a passion of yours. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> Deep I, secrets. Yeah. I I mean, I like all the trucks. I don't mind, but I think the type sixes are great. I think they're they can be used really well, especially in this state. Like oh yeah. We we're a lot faster on those type sixes. So yeah. I love them. They definitely have their purpose. I I mean, up in the Pacific Northwest, a type six is like where yeah. it's at, right? That's like how you get to places because you're not putting shit piles of hose unless it's a great camp campaign fire or something like that yeah. you need the water right yeah there's big timber and all that stuff but chances are you're going in there cutting line and you don't have enough water in the world to put out some of these duff layers you yeah know? it's you're just pissing in the wind at that point yeah so you wrap it up you fall all your hazards you clean it up the best you can you just dry mop it and then let all the other shit burn down in the pacific northwest but the type six rules the day up there as well it definitely has a utility so when you're outfitting all of these things, like a lot of people don't know what goes into that, all these engines, all this equipment, right? So let's bring up the equipment shop and how that whole thing goes down, like how they set the standards, what is, how they like assign a complement of like gear, all that stuff. I really would like to know how they come up with that. <laughs> <laughs> You if know, you guys know anything, I mean, I, it's I mean, not like Jade's here. Is he still in the yeah, equipment shop? Yeah, yeah, yeah he's yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, shout out to Jade, man. Yeah, and like, absolutely. <clears throat> Man, I know there's a certain dollar amount you're given from the equipment shop to outfit it to your district needs. Yeah. From my understanding, yeah. you know, I, I just we're just actually our type six is driving back right now from Texas. We just got a brand new one. Nice. Um, I put it together kind of a wish list, you know, of what we think would suit the needs of our district and our operations, um, you know, within Winnemucca. Um, you know, you just kind of run with that and, you know, get the blessing from everybody else, making sure everybody else is on the same page and, you know, oh, did you think of this? No, but I'll add it, you know, and you just kind of work together and, and figure that out. Um, and the aspects of like, you know, when, what the equipment shop decides, it, I couldn't really tell you, you know, based off, you know, I mean, a normal unit stocking of surplus items. I, I really couldn't tell you what their, how their deciding factor goes into that. Yeah. Well, it seems like there's like a national standard for what they're requiring for like engine typing, right? As far as like the the nuts and bolts, the pump package, the lights, all that shit that goes on the vehicle. But and they also set the standard for the NUS, right? Normal unit stocking, of yep. course. That's like a baseline minimum. Yeah, and it it is definitely a minimum. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's they, bare bones, man. Yeah. Yeah. If you've ever taken your truck down to the bare bones, what the NUS minimum is. It feels like you don't have anything on that truck. It's it's really nice. But it, it <laughs> like, look at all yeah. this room. Like, oh, I can put a bag here. Yeah. And then you oh, know, my coffee yeah. kit actually fits here. Yeah. <laughs> You're in a super heavy, and you got to make weight. Well, let's go down to bare minimum NUS. Then you know, let's instead of having ten Foresters, let's just go down to the three. That's all you need, really. I hate Forester nozzles, but uh, they definitely Likewise. serve their purpose on a Type here. Six for sure. Yep. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Running and gunning for miles. But I, I put mean, a hell of fire, bro. It's funny. It's like, I like to go look at what people put on their trucks. Like there's yeah. some good ideas that people have always like, I'm like, Ooh, I, I can steal that. But the biggest thing is I go in and I hate when there's like, there's three miles of hose on a truck. Mm-hmm. I don't have enough water 
to push that. And I don't really yeah. don't like, what are you doing? Like order more. Like, yeah. Dig. Like we, I mean, yeah, we drive equipment there, but like the philosophy for me, I it's get me from a to B and then back to a and in between, like, we're going to have fun. I got to get out and use my Lambert feedies. Like that, and that's <laughs> what I'm going to do. Yeah. Like I don't constantly need that. The hose or like, I hate hose packs, man. Like, I think every year, like it's that time of year for us, you know, get rain for fire season and you got to go out and you got to do, oh, let's go do the hose lid drill. And like, we're trying to come up with ways to make it funner for the dudes, like get engaged. Not but, doing the same shit over and over and over yeah, again. Yeah. But dude, you still got to throw the hose layout and I mean, it sucks. You're like, it's awkward. You got your pack problem. on. Yeah. It's, it's miserable. Then I mean, you got muscle yeah. hamster over there carrying like three hose packs and his pack and a fucking saw for some reason. Yeah. It's like, yeah. what is going on here? I mean, all that's just like learning points too, really. You know, like let's get out of the truck, let's stretch the legs and let's, let's, let's learn, let's teach teaching moment, you know? Oh yeah. So, I mean, that's the, my perspective is I might have a monitor on my truck, but do I need to use it every time? No, you no. know, really I don't, you know, depending on fuel type and, and how green or, you know, how vetted my seasonals are, then let's get on the floor and show some stuff about mobile attack, you know, true, true tactics of the old school way. Like, Let's get to work that way. So yeah, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? So yeah. these tactics have been developed back in the day, and they still work today. Well, they work for a fucking reason, right? Yeah, oh, absolutely. So, yeah, I mean the monitor thing. I mean we had a, I two four has a monitor too, and it's I've maybe used it like operationally twice, and it's just to get like some rat nest up in a tree that happens to be on fire. You're just like, <laughs> <laughs> all yeah, right, later. Yeah. <laughs> cool. yeah, I've never had a monitor until now, and I don't really know how I feel about it, just because. I mean, yeah, maybe it's that old school, just like feet on the ground, like, you know, and, and so just the, the idea of like the job of fighting fire from the cab of a truck, just, you know, I don't know. It's weird to me. Oh yeah. <laughs> I know. Yeah. That's where the engine slug terminology comes in. in my totally. opinion. Yeah. 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 No, it, yeah. Definitely. I mean, if I need to, yeah, if I need to like, you know, if I'm coming up and it's not the, the heel and I need to set up a spot to get the truck in and hammer down some water, but like, I want to get, you know, get folks out and pushing hose as fast as I can rather than just roll slow roll and be like, ah, you know, my hold, we're just going to put as much water out and waste it as we can. Cause that's yeah. a big point of pride for me as a captain is like watching trucks peel off to go fill up. And we're just like, let's just keep going. Just like, you know, good water oh, use yeah. and like, you know, being able to, yeah, put in all that line when you're going mobile. So. And that's why I probably want to, I want to say that mobile attack is probably some of the funnest shit you can ever do, man. Oh, yeah. There's like nothing like a good mobile. Yeah. Yeah. And people don't understand like how like good, like there's, all right, we're doing mobile. It's not great. But like when you're, especially on the sage and it's just ripping and you're like, oh man, like I got to start running. Like yeah. it's oh, so yeah. much fun. And at the end of the day, like, yeah, you just got your ass kicked. But then you're like, dude, look at that. Look how many miles we've gone. And you're like, yeah, it's miles. Not that and that's far. not an understatement. Miles. Yeah. Literal miles. miles of fire out. Yeah. And you're like, it's, it's just so much fun. Like, especially when you get a good rocking, like very well coordinated tandem. Like, say you have three or four engines going and then, you know, your lead's putting out fire. The other's following, maybe cleaning up the, you know, the line, securing the line. And then number one's out. They peel off. Next one just plugs right mm -hmm. in to keep on going, dude. It's, it's, it's some pretty cool shit to see a well-coordinated mobile attack. It's like magic almost. Oh yeah. Well, and it's crazy too, is like how well, like, you know, like everyone else can jump in and do it with them, mm -hmm. especially in our state. Like, Oh yeah. It's like a thing. It don't matter where you're at. Like it could be the Vegas truck that comes up with the Muck boys and Carson boys and like, okay, who's taking lead. All right. And then you're just sitting in the back. Like, I hope they run out of water. <laughs> yeah. It's my turn. I want to get some. Yeah. Like, don't catch this. Don't catch this. Like, we're not going to hit the corner yet, boys. Just, we're almost there. Oh yeah. Well, it's cool though, because like everybody on the, uh, in Nevada, at least on the engines and well, just everybody in general is pretty well coordinated and they just know exactly what to do. Like the, I want to say that the training in the state of Nevada is pretty good. One thing that kind of like threw me for a loop though, is working in under, other states and you, br you bring up the topic of mobile attack. It's like. Pump and roll. You pump and roll. They, not even that. It's like they don't do it. Right. right, right. And there's a, pl there's plenty of places out there that would benefit from like a solid mobile attack. Yet they don't really do it. I, I haven't seen it very much outside of the state, except for like certain areas, maybe like Eastern Oregon. I've seen it a handful of times. That's Idaho. It. 
Idaho. Idaho, Idaho too. Yeah. yeah. Especially like yeah, twin, south twin of Falls, Boise. Boise. Yeah. yeah. That all. Yeah. Bruno area. That's yeah. kind of that kind of area. They do yeah. it. Because it's cool. kind of like an extent. That, to me, that's an extension of Elko. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's a state line. Same line type. <laughs> same like, uh, terrain. Yeah. you know, like a little bit of not river bottom fires, but, you know, like Arizona might perform a little bit. Uh, Las Cruces, they did a little bit when I was down there. A little mobile attack, but. Was it, was, it common though? Like as common as it is here in it, Southern Idaho. I guess it's all dependent. We didn't get too many fires, but the one we did, you know, we just mobile attacked right off the road because the other side was the river. So, I mean, we just box got, it in. Yeah, exactly. Like use the roads and yep. Put it out. So, I mean, I started in Wyoming with the BLM and yeah, we mobile. You, you guys know? mobile? Oh yeah. I mean, I've never fought fire in Wyoming, um, so I guess I can't, you know, it's all for a reference. Mostly type six engines, but mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it was, it was mobile country and just get out and roll it, you know? So. Mm -hmm. Um, but I mean, and I, I came to Nevada, you know, for my first two seasons were 17, 18, which were obviously pretty exceptional. And so like the extent to which we mobiled here was, was impressive. Yeah. You know, like it was, you know, maybe a couple fires a summer when I was in, uh, Wyoming, but yeah, coming out here and it was like every fire for hours and like, yeah. So, oh yeah. Well, that just goes to show you like the amount of versatility in engines. Like I hate that. Like, yeah, there's engine slugs out there. Like everybody hates that term, right? But they're that's that name, that that derogatory term, I guess, exists for a reason because there are those people that fight fire from the cab, but that's not something you can do here. You don't even have the fucking opportunity to. Your ass is getting out of that cab and you're getting to work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, and I think it doesn't matter what part of the state, like you're getting out of that cab or eventually that you gotta go. Oh yeah. I feel like a monitor in Vegas would be nice about mid July. Yeah, just to spray in the air, man. <laughs> or Look like an July. elephant out there. Yeah. Like, all right, guys, go get under it. Let's go. But yeah, like it's, you just, I don't know, depending on which side of the state, but man, I love doing. But I, th I think it took me, I don't, I don't think I actually got to do mobile until like my fourth or fifth season in. Really? Yeah, I mean, on the Ely District, you don't do mobile. Yeah, like, it's super mountainous over yeah. there. It's, and it's, you just yeah. drive up, and then you get out, and you hike up, put it out. And then, like, the, you know, like those early years, I was on Hell Attack and a few other things. So, mm -hmm. <clears throat> which brings back the engines, like how much we are getting better at working with the others. So, like, with Hell Attack, like in Nevada, we get to go out and, like, do the trainings so that we can hover fill. That's and, the cool shit right And there. it's like that right there. Like, cool, we, we found a way to help out, like. So the helicopter, because there's no water. So yeah, yeah. There's not very many water that, sources. That's something unique. Yeah. Like the hover fill. Yeah. yeah. I mean, outside of Ely District, I don't think. <laughs> so I did it in I've Elko once. It. Uh, okay. And it, it was. A few times. Yeah. It was awesome to watch everyone around me. Like, what are you doing? I'm like, just, we got this. <laughs> and set up and just started. Yeah. We never, we never did it when you were there uh -uh. in Elko? Mm -hmm. yeah. hmm. I may have heard of it like being done but yeah the only time i've ever done it was in ely yeah oh yeah that's a thing that's that's another thing so hover fills let's let's go into that just for the people that are trying to understand what a hover fill is because it's not that is not common yep. and yeah <laughs> i'll talk about shit that's not really done outside of the state yeah so i think nevada i think we might be one of the only states that's able to do that um so yeah the helicopter comes in you get your engine set up with run out of 100 foot hose crate that thing up like make sure your pump is at full max <laughs> so you gotta have two people leave going. the foam off yeah <laughs> yes leave the, leave foam, the off. foam off i've seen that happen <laughs> but uh but that they put the recirc open and the foam's like constantly flowing oh, at one percent dude oh but uh and yeah and then you go out in that helicopter you go stand under it and it's hovering above you and two of you are trying to hold a bucket up yep <laughs> while somebody's trying to spray the water in there and you're you're gonna leave wet Oh yeah, you will. <laughs> like there's no way, especially if you got a newer person that's never like understood it and they like, and all that. Or they pressure. just slam the door open yeah. on the gate, or the gate open. <laughs> and you're like, oh my goodness. Like, and you're holding them there and they're freaking out because. It's it a lot of force coming out of these, this, like an inch and a half hose. If you fill yeah. a bucket with an inch or an inch and a half hose, there's a lot of force coming out of that at full yeah. you know, performance. But you also have a helicopter overhead. Yeah. Then you got the skids of the helicopter. Yeah. Right then you got the duck. There. You know, yeah. literally right there. Well, and then what, like, you know, if it's windy. he's lifting. <laughs> and so you're lifting a little bit, it feels like. Oh, yeah. But you're just like, all right. And then trying to get out of there. Like, I mean, it's, it's yeah. a good time. It's yeah. pretty wild, man. Like, 
It, people are probably going to be listening to this portion and be like, hover fills, you, are you guys high? Like, what, what the <laughs> fuck are you guys thinking, right? Like, who signed off on this? Yeah, who signed <laughs> off on this? It's yeah. like, they're probably thinking the safety card every time. But yeah. it's, 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 it's a lot safer than you think it is, obviously. There's always going to be an inherent risk with firefighting. It's a dangerous job. Oh, Newsflash. Yeah cool we don't have the ability to go just dip out of uncle joe's pond because you know it's his, his stock pond or something like that so we got to do with what we've got and that is one of those resources out there that we're, it's really effective yeah it'll speed the process up like it'll it gets the guys on the ground and engaged a lot faster i think like oh yeah especially in spots where, like where the trucks are still trying to get in there you got an extra truck around like hey we're gonna do a couple of hover fills so that we can boom and start anchoring this in because usually yeah, the engines get there. They can take this side, but that one's running up the hill. Like, yeah, you know, you can knock some steam out of it in the yeah. meantime. Yeah, it won't run as fast if you can get some guys going up different flanks. So. Support them with a uh, helicopter operations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a cool thing about uh, engines. I think I think that's underutilized. Everybody wants to be, you know, everybody wants the glory of oh, I'm a hotshot, lifetime hotshot, hand crew. You know, and it's it's more than that. I mean, engines are a great place, especially with the training and development side of things, right? there's a lot of versatility in engines you can crew up you can get off district and go see some other country you can go see different fuel types all that stuff and then uh yeah like things like are random like the hover fill there's a lot of versatility built in these platforms and i think it's oftentimes under underrated and overlooked mm -hmm. how w in which direction you can go with your career just by starting even out on an engine so <clears throat> and the, <clears throat> sorry the possibilities of moving up in your career yeah. engines, you're not stifled you know Engine is probably the the easiest way to move up in your career. Hot shots, everybody, like you said, everybody wants to do it. Everybody wants to be one. Yeah, but and that so, squad is not so going hard. anywhere. Yeah, man. correct. They're staying there. Yeah. Engines is, you know, you get your firefighter one, move up, get your ENOP. They're, and right now, we have so many openings throughout the state. <laughs> yeah. It's ridiculous. Oh, yeah. It's sad we have so many openings. Yeah. So many possibilities to move up in the engine program. There's a lot of uh, that's a that's a very complex topic there. I want to say just because of like the pay and classification issues, you know. And then Nevada is an expensive state. It doesn't matter if you're in Ely, Elko, Reno. God damn, it's expensive here. I mean, it's an expensive state. The cost mm -hmm. of living here is astronomical. And the, and people don't realize that. Like no, I, you know, like I've been in Vegas for a long time, but it was just as expensive to live in Elko or Ely, and it's like, dude. Yeah. And people are like, oh, it's just a small little town. Uh, yeah, that small. Yeah. So it costs more to get stuff there. And then the mining, like. It's money. It's, yeah. There's so much mining. And, and like one of the overlooked things too is like the agriculture community here. Like you go down to Austin, there's like some seriously fuck you rich people out there. Yeah. And it's all like generational wealth from like ag, either ranching yep. or uh, alfalfa farming. I mean, it's expensive. Yeah. Doesn't matter if you're in Austin, Nevada, dude. It's like. It's expensive. A shack in the ghetto with maybe a garage or a one car garage that was built in the 1940s is still going to be 300 grand. Yeah, which it shouldn't be. <laughs> Welcome to the club, man. It's, this is Nevada. Yeah. And I mean, you go other places like, you know, especially now it's a hiring thing. People are bouncing and it's like, yeah, all right, like, cool. They're going to offer you this little bit for now, but. Why? Why leave? Just stay. Stick it out. And that's the, it's the hard part. It's hard to find the right words to keep your dudes that want to work for you. But mm -hmm. I'm working with Weaver a lot this winter on the recruitment side of things. You know, I, I visited the high school a lot, just trying to get those 18 year old kids. Trying to recruit. You know, and yeah, a lot of their parents are in that mining industry. You know, and they make good money, and it looks really appealing growing up. And you know, dad or mom working for the mine is you know, you know, supporting you and you know, buying the things you want as a kid. And I think that's great. Pigeon house. Yeah. yeah. You, know, you know, hats off to the mining. Ramen every night. Yeah, exactly. You know, but, uh, you know, I, t I just tell them, you know, like, come try it and let the job speak for itself. Yeah. You know, cause like, that's going to tell you whether you love it or, or leave it. You know, and originally I wanted to do structure fire and everybody's like, go get your foot in the door in wildland. And my first season, I was like, I'm not leaving. I love it. You know? Yeah. And so, you know, get to travel, you get to do all that fun stuff. You know, and, and you get to see the country essentially, you know, putting fire out, standing where no man stood before. It's just, it's just, it hits deep sometimes, you know? And so that was like my biggest selling point. So for any of you listeners, you know, just give it a, give it a shot. Let yeah. the job speak for itself. Keep your toe in the deep end there. But also, <laughs> hey, side note, you guys get to, uh, well, working in Nevada on any platform, whether it's Hellcat, Cruise or Engines, 
you definitely get a good uh pin on some of your hunt zones you could do some little pre-scouting so oh yeah yeah that's yeah that's another <laughs> got that going for you as well but yeah i mean it's, it's hard though it's uh i mean the pay parity thing it's it's hard especially in this state and california is even worse i mean the cost of living here is like we're bitching about that but california holy fuck man it's like bad but that's the thing though it's like you have so much opportunity to move up you could be a gs fantastic i mean we have plenty of them in this room in this building for this whole week right and uh they all started somewhere and that's the thing is just getting your foot in the door starting somewhere because there's a lot of opportunity in, in fire i mean you don't even have to stay in fire you can go be an ologist or whatever it is so there's a lot, a lot of places to go and that's one of those big selling points like that you know, because I do help out with a lot of the recruiting down south. Like I, I love to go to the schools and, and try to get kids engaged. Mm -hmm. But that is one of the biggest selling points. It's like, hey man, you might not like fire, but like you got a retirement. Oh yeah, real quick. Like, and some of the schools like you go to, and depending which school it is, like yeah, they've got rich parents. Like they don't care. But you go to the one of the trade schools. You go to these lower income style schools, especially in Vegas. We got like twenty eight high schools. To try to visit all year and like you go to one of those schools where those kids are like wait i can get a job and do what yeah i can get a retirement i can do that like yeah man and the hardest part though is the application process that's oh, that's man. the killer yeah for sure like so yeah um at the state level last winter we started a recruitment retention program and uh yeah austin was our rep for winnemucca and we had district reps um throughout the state that were working on recruitment for you know their needs on the district and yeah going through that application process and like what we found was the the districts that were able to sit down with interested applicants and essentially walk them through the entire process you was where that, we saw though. the most success yeah like i had no fucking clue what i was doing when i first applied in usa jobs and that was shit almost 15 years ago right? yeah like how do you explain that to somebody over like the phone like, and oh, we you need to do this like and we're still getting, I mean, even, you know, applying for that, not even that first job, but that first career seasonal or whatever, like people are still getting hung up and getting, you know, kicked back. Or they forget to put their 40 hours a work week. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Or driver's license or whatever, yeah. you know, yeah. and yeah, you get hung up and then just the way the system works, like, all right, well, now you got to wait till this time next year. And then you're trying to convince them that it's still a good, a good choice to be here and, and, you know, put in that time and, and energy and wait that extra year for that career seasonal position or whatever. So that's where the challenge is just like, we're so rigid in some of the stuff that the way the system's set up, you know, like, whereas like, yeah, in the private sector, it's like a lot more flexible. It seems like, yeah. Give me your one page or two page resume, depending yeah. on if you're like mid career or entry level or professional, you know? Yeah. And it's just like, here you go. <clears throat> well, it's funny too, is how every organization does something different. Yeah. And this year was the first time I've ever seen the hiring, like they would go to Reading and all that. And he would just go up. Have you had a resume? And they're like, cool, I'll hire you. Wait, whoa, whoa. Why are you? Hold, hold on, hire? hold on. Like, <laughs> I wish it was that uh, easy yeah. for me. <laughs> and it's it's crazy how that works. But man, like the other biggest issue is these kids, like, they oh, this is too hard. Which is cool. Yeah. Like, all right, we weeded you out. But man, like, there's some you're, you're wishing that they would have applied. Like, so in Vegas, the one year I went to the school three different times, same school. First time there was like hundred kids in the room to talk with. Cool. Next time there's like 30 kids. Then I went back, there's 20 kids after school and they all brought their laptops and I had them all open them up, go into USA jobs. And we sat there for two and a half hours and we applied. Like, no shit. Yeah. And you know, I don't know if any of them took a job. They didn't come to Vegas, but you know what? Like I got 20 more kids to go in there. It's the start, right? But yeah, it was showing in the process and, and watching how it dwindled down, like exposure. Yeah. 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 It's the exposure right there. So it's, yeah, it's not the greatest way to go recruit. Like it's time consuming. That's for super sure. Super time consuming. But it, I mean, at the end of the day, like it helps, but well, I, kids would rather go be an AD anymore than, and that's how I started yeah. out, man. I mean, it's a great program for, especially for like a farm week. And I wouldn't have had, you know, worked into a permanent full-time position unless I started in the AD program, right? That was my foot in the door. And it's, I think it's a great program. It, it serves is, its purpose. It but if you want to like actually make a career out of this, like you got to apply, you got to start somewhere, you got to get in. So. Yeah. And I think the ADs are great. I mean, um, you know, we have ENA and WNA and yep. like 
worked with them those, a lot. Those programs, you know, provide, I think also like a catch all where, you know, it, at least two or three guys this year where, um, you know, there were, there were engines that were interested in with them. Then they messed up their application, but it's like, all right, we'll get this AD application in, you know, and then, mm -hmm. um, at the very least, like we can capture some of that population that's still interested, but, but may have been missed. So, you know, I think the biggest part of it is just that tracking though, is like, you know, going to the high schools or whatever, but then like that follow up and just keeping up with them. And, and that's where the districts did really well this winter with just like, um, you know, creating like events where you know like you guys had folks come down to the station right yep, and yep. and then like elko rented out a um lap or a um it's like a computer computer lab, lab. yeah yeah, yeah. Okay, at like the a, community college there. yeah okay and just like what three or four sessions throughout december where they were open and people could come in and and apply so see that's the way to do it man if we want numbers i mean this it's facetime really at the end of the day it's exposure because I mean, we everybody in this room has probably experienced it. Nobody knows what a wildland firefighter is, right? Right. You go in the grocery store, you're, you know, getting your lunch for the day or whatever. You get your green pants on, your boots and your crew shirt. Cool. Someone asks you, oh, what do you do? And you say, I'm a wildland firefighter. What do they typically say? Thank you. <laughs> well, yeah, nowadays, smaller, well, smaller yeah, towns, yeah, it's going to smaller be a little bit towns, different. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, like, so in Vegas, people don't understand. Like, yeah. people look at me funny, like, because they're like, you have a beer. Yeah. Like, you're a firefighter? Yeah. yeah. Like I, I'm a cool firefighter. Like, <laughs> I, go, I go do things. I'm a real boy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and it's, that's where, I mean, really I'm just a supervisor now, but I mean, back in the day, like being on the trucks and that, like, yeah, you do what? All right. Then it's a long process. Like, trying to I, explain it, right? Yeah. They automatically assume that you're either a, a cow fire or B a smoke jumper, right? Yeah. Cause that's like the glory that yeah. everybody, everybody knows them. That you jump like out a helicopter. So yeah. it's like, yeah, like how we long. I got yeah. two saws, like we're going. Motorcycle, yeah. motorcycle, motorcycle stuff. chainsaw in one hand. There's some homework assignment for the listeners there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've, I've learned that a couple of times the last few days. Like I say like these shows or movies and everyone around me like, what? And I'm like, go watch that now. Yeah. Like you need to go watch that. And now I'm turning into one of the older guys in the room. I'm like, ah. What do you mean you haven't seen Idiocracy? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's the best documentary ever. <laughs> Yeah, it's blowing me away. It's 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 a uh, kind of shock these days. Yeah, well, I, mean, I think that's like uh, the PR problem that we kind of have. It's like we don't do a good job of telling our story. So, I mean, a lot of people just don't know what the federal side of wildland firefighting is. They see smoke in the air somewhere off in the hills that they probably may or may not have visited or hiked through or whatever, and then green, yellow buggies they show up. Then depending on the severity of the fire, how long it goes for, they take off. It's like they show up in the dead of night and they just leave and smoke's gone. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Cal fires over there doing like structure protection and they're yeah. very, very visible. I mean, then that in the retardant planes, I mean, you can't miss that. <laughs> so, well, and it's, I think we're getting better at trying to tell our story. I just don't think we, I mean, I, I'll be honest. I hate when the camera comes out, like yeah. whenever they're like on the fire line, because somebody is sitting over there watching like, oh, Nip. you don't have your gloves on. Like, yeah, I don't have my gloves on. I'm on the radio. The Blue Falcon like, shit. Yeah. And yeah. it's like, stop that. Like, stop. Like, you know, we look at these pictures, but if it's a good shot, like, okay. Like, I'm glad you caught that. But don't come hammering down on yeah. me. That way I'm like, okay. Yeah. I'll remind them next time. Like, hey, we got to do this. Like, put your damn glove on. When, you know, we sweat through our hands. So you wear your gloves all day. You're going to go you really fast yeah, because you're gonna have holes in your hands yeah like you've got to take your gloves off like eventually you do you, we tell it and preach it but like go mess with the pump those gloves are not on for very long no but i think we're getting better at telling our story the social media pages like letting people sit there and make their put their little pictures of what they've done they're all dirty like the younger kids love doing that like it's great i think it's starting to but you know, there's everyone, a time and place. Yeah. Yeah. And then everyone just always thinks, Oh, do you go to California? <laughs> <laughs> if I hear, yeah. if I had a nickel for every time I heard that, I'd be a very, very rich man. Oh yeah. <laughs> Jesus, man. You are. But it's getting better. I mean, like the whole social media thing, like doing it for the gram, like don't do stupid shit, but it's also at the same time, it's important to share that story with your friends, your family. Sometimes some of that content goes viral and people learn, man. And like, yeah, if you don't have your gloves on in a photo, 
chances are you didn't need your gloves on, man. Yeah. It's, it's, we make these, these decisions about safety and PPE and stuff like that, right? If you're well removed from the fire and you don't need gloves, then you don't fucking need gloves. The FMO shouldn't be busting your balls about that yeah. because everybody out there knows when the appropriate, well, for the most part, <laughs> not everybody, <laughs> but for the most part, you know, if the, if your leadership is taking their gloves off, the chances are you can afford to take your goddamn gloves off. Yeah. Man. So screw it. Stop harping on people and just like spread the positivity. Tell the story. It's important because we do have a PR problem. That's yeah. I mean, when I was talking with the kids, you know, one of the questions that comes up is sounds scary or is it scary? It can be. It, it can be at times. Absolutely. But you know, we give you the training and everything you need to do it safely. And that's when you just start trusting that leadership, you know, above you. Um, you know, all of us in this room has probably seen a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and we build that mental slide of, we saw it, we, we sifted out what we liked, what we didn't, and we store it in our long-term memory. So if we're ever faced with that challenge again, we, we know what to do at that point. Yeah. You build those slides, yeah, right? Exactly. It was mental slideshows, you know, so. Yeah. But there is something kind of attractive about like one, the dirtbag lifestyle. And it's kind of been a, like a recurring theme with all these conversations I've been having with folks this week. And, uh, it's, it's enchanting, man, but it is very much a young man and young woman's sport. I mean, when you start getting into like the level of your careers, right? It, it's got its different challenges, man. I mean, you guys have uh, guided your careers to, you know, be successful, especially with dealing with like the issues that everybody fucking is eating the same turd sandwich when it comes to pay classification. But there is a lot of things on the horizon to make that better. And I want to say to shout out to Nevada that they're being pretty progressive. I fucking hate using that word because depending on what flavor of politics you you belong to that word progressive can have some serious negative connotation right but i think that uh for the definition itself i think that nevada is pretty good at taking their taking care of their people getting them trained up getting them paid getting them the right grade for like engine captains i mean what they're eights now yep yeah mm. and that was what that's recent that was what four or five years ago all right yeah 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 and just pushing the boundaries, man, and getting people like the stuff that they need to do their job successfully and also live like. <laughs> well, and that's where that retention part comes in. I mean, like, I think BLM Nevada has done a really good job in terms of like, uh, they have started like this health and wellness, um, like week long, uh, class that they did one in Vegas and they did one in Reno and like, mm -hmm. that was great. I attended the one in Reno and, you know, I mean, it was an opportunity to learn, um, you know, like in a, a longer period of time, like both like, you know, from a mental and physical nutritional wellness, you know, standpoint, yeah, whole body, right? Stuff. Holistic yeah. top down. And you know, that stuff then that we're able to take back to the districts and then, um, you know, hopefully disseminate and, uh, and continue, but like, even, you know, this, like bringing everybody together in the spring, like that goes a long way throughout the whole season because, you know, like when you run into somebody inevitably in Winnemucca, like you've, you've at least met them mm -hmm. or recognize them like, Oh yeah, I saw you at, you know, the spring meetings. And like, so, um, like you're getting at it before, like just, you know, having those opportunities to interact preseason, like that's super unique to Nevada at a statewide level, which is cool. Yeah. I've only experienced that kind of, uh, preseason meeting. So like where it's kind of similar to this in the Rogue River Siskiyou. So up in region six, but that's the only other place that I've ever seen it done. They bring outside, you know, consultants and I guess the Academy as well when I was going through the Jack Academy. But, uh, yeah, I think Nevada is good because they're, they're not afraid of begging for forgiveness as Brock would say, <laughs> it's, yeah. they just do shit and it's, it's, it's obviously working. It's productive. Right. Yeah. They've been, I mean, I've been coming to this meeting for a very long time. Yeah. Um, and it's gotten way better. We're bringing in people, but now they're actually asking what we want. And so now it's like, all right, finally, like, I want to see this, this, and this at the meetings. And, and like the mental health has always been the biggest push. Yeah. And then like, okay, like getting the mind right, but we're forgetting some things. So bring someone in, you know, breathe through your nose. <laughs> like, <laughs> like it's awesome that we're doing that. Finally bringing in people that are actually what we're asking for. Like, yeah. And which Brock has done a great job at and Paul and all them. Like, it's cool that we're finally, it's a little bit, you know, like they're not giving us everything we've always asked for, but yeah. To give that little bit, I mean, that's a reason to come back to work every day, like get a little bit of appreciation. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And feel like somebody's listening, yeah. you know, because in the government, it can very easily just, you know, especially five, 10 years in, you're just like, you don't feel like anything you say goes anywhere. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. We get those people that are like, 
the traditional high level government employee where they're fucking retired in place and they don't do shit because they don't care. They're two ways, two years away from retirement. Right. right. It's not like that here. No, 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 not anymore. I mean, but year five as a firefighter, that's about when you realize you're like, like okay, I'm, I, you, it's like the honeymoon. Like you're just coming out of the honeymoon stage. <laughs> no, shit's getting and, real. Yeah. Shit's getting real. I got to I got a really good quality, you know, like we're going to do something. And then next thing you know, you're like, fuck, man, what am I doing? And then you're sitting there bitching, like, why am I still doing this job? The sport bitching phase. Yeah. yeah. And then next thing you know, you're like, oh, shit. Like, I've got like eight or nine years till my 20 and I can retire. Like, fuck. Like, I guess I'm stuck, man. I'm over the hill. Like, <laughs> I actually better start changing some shit. But like, that's the, that's where I'm at right now. I'm on the downside of, you know, get get through a few more pack tests and, and we'll see what happens. Yeah. That's another thing too, man. It's like, this does have a, a, a good feel to it. And, uh, and I know it sounds like I'm riding for the brand for the Nevada BLM. Right. But that's like pretty much a majority of my career. It is the majority of my career exclusively, not exclusively, but primarily in Nevada. Right. And I've seen the things that, uh, the state has done with all of their programs, right. Firewide. And it's great, man. I keep coming back for a reason. I mean, I went to region six, fucked off at the academy yeah dude it's it's i keep coming back for a reason so well i think it's funny too is like in nevada like we go somewhere we all you know going back east or or up north like you everyone asks like where are you from like oh i'm from nevada and they're like oh do you know no, not so, vegas yes. yeah i say nevada. vegas is nine <laughs> fucking hours away yeah. from reno okay oh, yeah yeah that's always oh you live in las vegas i'm like yeah but i really like i grew up in real nevada yeah. Oh, Reno? <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, speaking of, tying in on that point, you talk to people and they're from Nevada. It's like, oh, yeah, I drove through Nevada. It's ugly as fuck. I'm like, get off the beaten path, man. There's yeah. some beautiful country. Like Wheeler Peak out there, man. Yeah. It's, it's gorgeous there's, out there. But it's all spots. off the beaten path. All of it. Yeah. You, you gotta stop that's being not lazy, necessarily a right? bad thing that people drive down I-80 and don't stop. Yeah. <laughs> don't want to move in. This is true. Right. <laughs> they just keep going right through. They can go to Idaho. They yeah. go to Utah. Like, yeah. keep getting, don't come into our state. <laughs> you know, Sandy, Utah. Nothing to see here. Sandy, Utah is a beautiful place. You should definitely move <laughs> yeah. there. Nevada's ugly. It sucks. It's ugly. <laughs> We've got aliens. Like, we got nuclear waste. Yeah. <laughs> don't, don't, don't come down here. But it, it is true, though. Like, man. There is some cool shit in our state. There is, man. People don't. People don't need to know about it. Yeah, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna <laughs> stay on I-80. Yeah, yeah, stay, stay on, on I-80. I-80. Yeah. I mean, I kind of give away uh, the Wheeler Peak thing. Was that this is the tallest uh, peak in Nevada, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, everybody knows about that, though. You can look it up. Yeah, so. it's it's a national park. Like, yeah, I'm not gonna drop any of my like hunting spots or anything like that. But no, but like, stay the hell out of my rivers. You're overfishing them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I still haven't seen a river in Nevada. We have no water. <laughs> We've got no water. There's hey, no water here. That, that home period. bolt fits a son of a gun. Yeah. Let's just keep getting <laughs> class shorter five, and shorter. Class five rabbits yeah. in the home bolt. <laughs> so let's talk about training, man. Um, the training programs, I think, with the Nevada, with all of Nevada BLM is pretty good, but engines, I think, kind of stands out and shines as well. I mean, you got the ENOP Academy, and that's some pretty cool shit. I mean, what is it now? Because when I went through it, it was about a week. Yeah, is it's it still, still a week? week. Okay. I didn't know if it changed or anything like that, but it's six there... days. Yeah. 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 Classroom time, field portion, driving trucks, doing cone courses. And then it's a crash course in like Evoc, man. It's cool. Yeah. And hats off to those guys, you know, that, that coordinated it. Like Braun, I know, I know he took chair from Biddle mm-hmm. and, you know, he's coordinating that, I think, right as it ends. Wait, the, Jeremiah? Yeah. Jeremiah yeah. Braun. Oh, hell yeah. yeah. How's that dude doing? He's doing good, man. Right yeah. on. Yeah. Um, it's just sad. We have a dozer guy this year that's going to be doing it. He's yeah, new jobs. So. Yeah, yeah, but uh, I think the coordination for that starts right after it ends. Really, mm-hmm. I mean, there's a lot of plan and planning going into it, and who wants to help teach what, and you know, how many members are we going to be expecting next year, and logistics, and and all that fun stuff. So, I mean, hats off to him for taking on that, and you know, and for Biddle for for running it. The yeah, like the decade he did. <laughs> it, it seems like you know, I mean, he taught my class back in uh, fifteen, sixteen, somewhere in there. So, I mean. Yeah, that's off the Biddle too. I'm trying to remember when I went to Enop. I think it was the year before Biddle. I was under C Mass, so Chris oh, Mason. Nice. Yeah. yeah. So I want to say it was like shit, 2013, 14. I don't know. I blacked out. <laughs> yeah. But it's cool, man, because it's like a it's like a crash course in everything engine operations, right? I mean, 
do I like doing uh, volume calcs and all that stuff, like flow charts and all that shit? No, I don't think anybody likes that stuff. And I, I, I if someone busted out a slide rule on a fire, <laughs> I'd probably punch him in the fucking face. <laughs> but it's good. It's useful math in some context, right? There's some things you can pick up, some things you can remember. Um, is it practical to, you know, bust out a slide rule on a fire? No, it's not. But it might serve its purpose for going somewhere else, right? Maybe you end up at the equipment shop and you have to do something, right? Do some calculations. I don't know. I don't know where that would serve its purpose. Enough about that shit. But there's other things that are of value in the ENOP program. Um, and just like day-to-day -day operations and maneuvering, like evasive maneuvers, stuff like that, backing, and familiarizing yourself with your vehicle. Yeah, that's the huge one. Like, So I think these guys, like we bring in everyone from around the state. It's got a whole little niche to how they're helping at that academy. Mm -hmm. And uh Flong, one of the guys in Vegas, man, this dude can find anything wrong with the truck. Like he was always walking around and he's like, Hey, this is broken. And it's like, all right, fix it. Like, fuck. But, <laughs> but like he's Don't telling me, the dude. kids like to like really get engaged and look at things. And and that's what you need, man. Like yeah. the attention to detail. Yeah. And when it take they take an extra five minutes to do a, the daily check, like, okay. But did you find something wrong? Like, no, I just I was really worried. I don't care. Like if you're worried, yeah. if you were looking. You're accounting for safety, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. And that's, a, I think the coolest part is like these kids are getting, you know, a little secret from everybody. Like, Hey, always check this, always look at this. And so it helps out. Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, the thought of bringing everybody's engine with them from throughout the state, you get to look at what's going on throughout the state. You're not mm -hmm. just looking at your own engine all week. You're looking at Ely's type six, Vegas too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're jumping on and for operating sure. other vehicles too. Type threes, type fours, sixes, you get a, get the whole batch. So it's a, mm -hmm. one of the top things I think about that Enoch Academy. One thing I think that's cool about the uh, standardization, like across the entire state, especially with any ground vehicle, crew vehicle, or engine, right? Any apparatus that we have out there is the uh, standardization of medical equipment. Oh yeah, that is fucking cool, man. That and the expanded scope of practice that we have for our medical direction. But that yeah. was something that was pretty cool too. But everybody knows where it's at. Yeah. Everybody. Yeah. Look for the sticker. It's right there. Yeah. It's right there. You know, what's going to be in yep. there too. Yeah. So. Every bag's the same. Like, all right, cool. Yeah. If there's an IWI though, that's, that's time saving. That's potentially life saving. Yeah. Just having like that knowledge that everything's standardized. So, but yeah, man, uh, I don't know about you guys, but I used to drive like an ass still kind of do, but I have kids now, so I don't drive like an ass anymore. They're usually in the backseat, but I will say that the ENOP Academy translated into like just everyday stuff. Like it's probably made me a better driver overall. And I think I want to just like attribute that to the ENOP program. What about you guys? I'm a shitty driver. I drive fast. Uh, I don't drive fast in my truck because it, it won't go. It's an old truck. But uh, <laughs> I drive like an asshole. But I mean, it does. It does help you out. Especially the situational awareness part. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like I don't hit as many tree branches anymore. But that was trial and error. Like <laughs> some things are learned the hard way. Yeah, but that I mean, that place has really taught you. Like I think it's gotten better. I've I haven't gone back since I went to Enop. I haven't gone back and helped. I just wasn't like yeah. I just wasn't into it. But everyone else like they keep telling me new things that happen every year. I'm like, all right, this is cool. You guys are getting a lot better. Yeah. So do the uh, cadre of Enop? Do they still fuck with the students when they go out on their field days? Their op day. I, I want to say they do. They yeah. go out and, you know, they'll crack open a valve or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, they'll or, do that or, you know, un unlatch a battery box strap or wedge something. Wedge a fucking rock yeah, inside the throttle just, of your pump. Yeah, just to see if they find it. You yeah. know what I mean? And it's great. You know, practice like it's live, you know, and, you know, for taking away, you know, in the life perspective, I think anything, ENOP, any trainings we do, it, it's, you could take something from it and, and make it part of your life, you know, and how you, how you take it, you know, and incorporate it in your own life, personal life, whatever. Yeah. There's always key takeaways, like our leadership classes. I think they're great, you know, all that fun stuff. But yeah, I think uh, for takeaways, every class we offer really is is one of those courses where you could take something and implement it. Oh, yeah. That it implements itself. Like you can take a crew boss class and still get something for your engines, right? You can take a, a Heckam class. And obviously we talked about the Hoverfield. That's, that's a huge benefit, right? Knowing mm -hmm. you get some familiarity with ships. Uh, side note on the uh, ENOP Academy, shameless admission of guilt here. When we went to do our field op day, well, 
it was either CMAS or Scojo or one of the guys over there. They decided to crack open the uh, like full board, not even crack it. They just fucking opened up my protection line and it had Ooh. those bins. Oh, I had a PTO pump. So oh. me explosion <laughs> being eager to get after it and go after the fire, the, the flagging fire, right? Uh, fired up the PTO pump and boom, just fucking throws, just goes <laughs> popping out of the box, dude. <laughs> I that's a lesson learned though. It was it is yeah. So I I like to do that to all my like people. We'll all be like, hey, let's go down to the gas station. We're gonna go get a drink. So the kids are excited. They're in, jumping in the truck, and then I look over at whoever my operator was. I'm like, hey man, and they'll boom and I turn the pump on, and then everyone jumps out, and I'm yelling like it's the panic mode. Like we yeah. gotta get, we're gonna gotta flank this. Like the kids are freaking out, trying to grab hoses. You just throw them right into the shit. Yeah, and then. Training, you know, crank the crank the pump up and then as soon as they grab I'm like we got protection we got to burn like i'll hit that thing and just watch the people just launch and i'm like man i'm it's bad <laughs> like it sucks like but it's good training because you never yeah. know when it's gonna happen like true i just make it more lifelike because i don't yell at the dudes that often like, you, know, you speak with a purpose yeah though, right but like those guys when i'm like hurry the fuck up like we gotta move like we're getting the fires coming and Really just trying to sell, like, and they know nothing's going on, but like. What's well, the intensity, right? Yeah. You're trying to mimic that. And there's no replication for some a situation that you would be in. Right. Like, there's no replicate for that, except for when you're in it, right? Yeah. But if you can just turn up the stress, turn up the the volume, turn up all the, I guess, the heat of the moment, right? Mm -hmm. You get a lot of out of it. Yeah. Because now, like, those, man, those kids, they figured out, like, you got to open that box. You can't just turn the, can't <laughs> yeah. go up there like that because they go, boom. And, and then, then you never getting that fucker out. Yeah. Or it's going to blow out the side of it. Like yeah. I did. <laughs> yeah. Oops. Yeah. Which is awesome to see. But yeah, like you have to train those because you never know. You're not always going to be with them either. No. Like that's you could be thing. walking away from a truck and be out like scouting shit. And next thing you know, like they're having a moment down there, like shit hitting the fan. And, and, you know, luckily in this day, like we've trained our dudes well enough that hopefully we've trained them well enough, you mm -hmm. know, that they're going to be able to jump out and do their thing. That's the one nice thing about ENOP. Like you guys go over it like crazy. So, mm -hmm. well, that's another thing too about uh, ENOP. I think people see that qual on people's red cards and they kind of overlook it, especially like the Forest Service, right? Oh, yeah. Cause they don't have it. They don't have it, yeah. right? <clears throat> yeah. But it's not a thing with them. The expectation, though, I think there's a lot of value for the Bureau of Land Management, the ENOP program, because if you look at that qual and then your captain and your FMO and everybody around you, the expectation of having that qual and being ENOP is that you are effectively the assistant. I mean, yeah. you are responsible and you're, it, say you had to go tie in with division or go like scout or whatever, the captain, right? You were very much in charge of whoever else is on the, on the, on the truck, right? Yeah. That's your safe, their safety is in your hands yep. and your own. So yeah, it's I mean, overlooked. A, a competent, a competent ENOP should be able to manage the truck, right? I mean, yep. The way I run my truck is my, you know, assistant engine captain or ENOP is like, that's his truck. Like if he needs me for something, I'm there, but like, I want complete ownership of that equipment for him. That's and, how uh, Bronson ran it too. Yeah. I, it was my baby. Yeah. 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 That's, that's how I did it. Like I would be like, Hey man, here you go. Uh, NUS this, get the boys, do your thing. I'll go start the paperwork. Yeah. And then I, then it, like I expect them to, to show me where everything's at because I know they moved it. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, where's my coffee? You know, <laughs> quit moving my shit. Like, where's my granola bars? But you know, like it's it's funny, is like I make the dudes go and then they have to have the seasonals sit there and show me where everything is and know the NUS. Like, where is everything on this truck? Mm -hmm. And it's engraved. But yeah, man, I think we're just a guy on the truck. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's funny that you like move up in your career and like the less firefighting you actually do. It's like the more you move up, the less ops you do. You're just like basically a paper bitch after a while. So yeah, yeah. it I, sucks, but I it's got, the truth. I got lucky. I got a class A driver on my truck this year. I've been driving and acting as captain ENOP or whatever for the last like two or three years. Mm -hmm. So I finally got a, a decent, you know, ENOP trainee. He's got a class A CDL. Perfect. I get to be on the ground with my dude and go on mobile attack. You know, like I get to, you get to do the fun shit. I get again. to do the fun stuff again. Yeah, yeah. exactly. You know, so looking forward to it for sure yeah but yeah man the engine program is it's pretty bitching for nevada i've had great experiences the entire time i've been you know with nevada i mean just in general like it doesn't matter if it's hell attack or detailing with a crew or on engines or 
detailing with W and A, it's fun, man. And I think there's a lot of opportunity on the engines to explore different paths too. Cause sometimes you'll have a slow season. So maybe your second year or maybe shit, maybe even your first year sometimes you get to go detail with like a Helitech crew or go plug in with W and A and just like crew up and or do a task force role. Mm -hmm. That shit's fun, man. It's gotten a lot better too. Like, so like, yeah, those younger kids and building these crews, like the AD crews, like, mm -hmm. you know, in Vegas, we have SND and then Reno, it's the CR regulars. And now like to get more exposure, like we go either or like, which is awesome, you know, and ENA, like they need help. We send guys up, like it's, it's getting dudes out. And it's like, my biggest thing is like, okay, I, I want you to be a good dude on the engine. I don't want you to leave my program, but I want you to go fight fire and actually learn. Like, yeah. You can't just stay on this one thing. Like, you need those exposure. You need to go work over here. You need to like do that. But I don't want you to leave. But I'm gonna just detail you out. Like, yeah. If the person falls in love and wants to leave, like, cool. Like, yeah. if you love it, I let them go, man. <laughs> yeah, you let them go. <laughs> and I mean, and that's Elka's the, best the place to be. Yeah, for that. Mm. You know, we got the dozers. <laughs> we got <laughs> the hand crews. We got the helicopters. We got the engines. Yeah, you got it all. Tell yeah. me another district that has that. Yep. I can't. <laughs> You've got it all. Okay. Come to Elka. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We're doing a competition here. It's like, who's got the best district? Well, no. So it's funny. <laughs> is, uh, <laughs> I think, I think, you know, like we said earlier, like we're hurting for people, man. Like yeah. it sucked, but uh, I am not hurting. Uh, yeah, I, I have every captain's <clears throat> spot filled. I have backup. Um, Stop. But at the beginning of the year, this is like, painful for you, isn't it? Yeah. Well, last night he was trying to, he was talking to somebody like, Hey, come he's trying to poach your people. Mm, no, yeah. no, it wasn't my people, but I mean, I mean, if they wanted to go, I was like, yeah, go for it. Yeah. But I mean, that's, that's the great thing about Nevada. Like I came off of a, a hand crew, uh, after the season in 16 and I got hired as a career seasonal in Elko as an operator. I had my unop already, but, um, you know, fortunately we had a, a good season in 17, but you know, like then a captain opened up in 18. So I went from a GS five seasonal in 2016 to a engine captain, you know, in two seasons. Yeah. That's pretty, you know, and I mean, right place, right time, you know, and, um, but I mean, you know, like there's few other places, especially, you know, at that point, like, I feel like I would have been able to make that big of a leap and, and, you know, feel like, all right, I made the right decision. I'm, I'm making moves forward. So yeah. Yeah. Made the right decision to come to Elko. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's another truth behind that though. It's like people don't want to admit the fact that, that they have to move around to move up, right? You have to. And that's one thing that's good about the engines. It gives you a, a, a good baseline of diversity and experience because you get to go do these things. You get to go IC single trees. You get a, probably a good chance to punch off your IC5 pretty quickly, you know, just because of the lightning storms and stuff that comes through here and get a lot of single trees and you're hiking into that thing and you're putting it out, calling it in, getting those reps in. You have a lot of potential to get the experience on engines, but at the end of the day, you still need to move around to move up. In a way you do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, for the, mean, yeah. yeah. It depends on how like patient a, you are. I guess yeah. a bigger picture, yeah. not just necessarily Nevada. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it could have been a motto of, you know, the, the 15, 16, 17, even 18, um, you know, with, with the, the hurting of people now, you know, I mean, there's doors opening probably at every district for anybody really. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so I, I mean, still float around by all means, you know, network, get to know everybody, um, but, you know, find home, you know, and, and see what the opportunities look like. And if they're not there, you know, there's always Elko, there's always Carson, there's always Vegas, there's always Ely, you know, I mean, we work great, I think as a state in whole, you know, just trying to work on this recruitment retention and all that fun stuff that we yeah. did all winter. Mm -hmm. It was, it was an awesome, awesome to be a part of that. So, and I think, you know, again, like, things like this are so valuable because, you know, like I'm talking with, um, you know, guys from Ruby mountain hotshots yesterday and like, you know, about what they need and how we might be able to help. And, you know, like, you know, just making those opportunities and creating those relationships, like, because like ultimately, you know, it, it is all Nevada BLM folks here, but you know, regardless of it was for service and BLM or whatever, like we're all trying to do the same thing at the end of the day. And we're all yeah. trying to, progress forward and, and, you know, look out for our people and get them the best opportunities we can. So, you know, like if, if I can kick somebody, you know, four hours away to Elko for, you know, two or three weeks to get that opportunity, then 
as long as I can make it work on my end, I'm going to do it. It's not going to be a question. So, you know, but knowing that they need that is half the battle and, and, you know, being able to communicate across the state is huge. Oh yeah. I think another thing that's uh, beneficial about the engine programs too, is like the flexibility you like, you guys, even you said it, right. You have the ability to, to like grab somebody for two weeks. So if someone has a wedding to go to, or if someone has like a birthday for their kid or like, I don't know, family, whatever event, right. You, you have a lot of flexibility built into that to where you can like, Hey, true. I got to go for yeah. this, this wedding. Do you mind if I do this? Right. Yeah. Get back to work. <laughs> or to have a baby. Shut up and dig. Yeah. yeah. Or to have a baby. Have a baby. Yeah. 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 That. Good timing. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, it's I thought every planned, like, you know, <laughs> you want that baby either delivered in the fall or the spring, you know, yeah. not if you want a summer <laughs> off. Yeah, you know, <laughs> you try to plan and it just doesn't work that way. No, ain't that the truth? I, but, have, yeah. I have summer babies too. Don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> I, I miss a lot of birthdays. Mm -hmm. But that is one thing that's getting better though, is like that, that work life balance. And like when I first started out in 2009, the expectation was, I mean, this is not very long ago, right? Yeah. I only have 11 seasons in under my belt and I don't even fight fire anymore. I'm not even in the game, but it seems like overall that there's a lot more respect for, uh, like, personal stuff going on. There's a lot more leeway to go to those birthdays, those weddings, those blah, 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 go see your son or daughter be born. Right. And I think that's a, a major change that's happened over the last maybe six, seven years. Yeah. Yeah. It's like that acceptance, you know, yeah. I mean, paid 12 weeks off now for a know, baby for having a child. Yeah. No shit. Yeah. I had, I had, uh, well, I guess I didn't have him. My wife had our son. Uh, you still got paternity leave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I got. Uh, I had our. We had our son in July, uh, 2021. I took six weeks off. Came back in August. Jumped on a fire assignment. Came back and then still had the six weeks to burn during the winter. You mm -hmm. know, and so really thankful for that. You know, big part of his life is, you know, he's born. It's game changing. It's, it's oh yeah. It's you know it it was awesome to be able to be a part of that. You know, and and know that my engine back home is being covered. And you know, I can forget about work for the six weeks and that's a big thing focus. you don't have to drag it home exactly so big changes for sure though oh yeah like when i had my kids years ago like i didn't we didn't have that i i went and then a week later i was back at work like i thought i was gone way too long like missed 40 hours of work i gotta get back oh, shit. yeah you know and like that was just the mindset back then like in the early like my early career like you gotta get here like, this is the only way you're gonna make money you gotta be here now I see these dudes, I get really jealous of like, you got how many days off? Like 12 weeks, like what the, <laughs> you know? Like, yeah, I try not to talk about it too much. Well, guess what? <laughs> a couple thousand people are listening, so buckle up, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it is good though, that they're thinking of that and like, and being more acceptable to like, you know, I'm the worst about it. I'm like, dude, you want, you want how many days off? Like, no, dude, you get back to work. You take your two, let's go. But I'm getting more better, like, more better. That's his credit. More better. Earth. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I'm getting better about it just because that's, it's bringing the dudes back to work. Like, yeah. Like go just have, happy like, too, yeah. Man. And it's, you know, it's, it's a happy life. If, if you're, you know, the happy wife, happy life, but how those guys need it. Yeah. You know, we have a, we have a very high divorce rate in the, in the fire service. Like, people struggling and it's and if you don't know how to like have those battles like yeah i'm either gonna lose the dude because you know he's like i gotta quit like fuck this i'm out yeah or yeah. i'm gonna lose the dude because he doesn't know how to handle that stress you know and like or doesn't have the resources yeah. that he knows about to get yeah. the help that he needs yeah. or they need and so now we're that's the best thing is we're transitioning all that and adapting to the culture and the changes you yeah. know and you know, there are resources now, you know, mm -hmm. through Vindy Fire Info. I mean, there's there's counseling, there's there's all those resources out there now that are you know, they're on a plate. You just gotta pick it up. Yeah. You know, and it's it's kind of nice to see that the Nevada BLM is really making that push to, you know, take care of our own. Mm -hmm. So well that's another thing too, like you guys all have mentioned that it has changed over time, like that whole work life balance thing, the whole like taking care of our own. I mean yeah, everybody's got their different like expectations of their employees and we all do, man. I'm expecting them to show up and work just as hard and just as long and be there and be present and all that stuff like that. But then again, if I were to do it all over again, I would try and have, I would I'd rather have what we have now, that, that expectation of you being able to take that time off, be with your family. But I was thinking about this last night during the bowling thing and having some conversations with everybody. 
And it's, it's because of the people in this room. It's like you, 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 everybody in that room, we set the pace for the new generation of firefighters, right? Yeah. It's, it's thanks to folks like us, not me, obviously I'm just a dickhead with a microphone and a camera, but it's folks like us that have set the pace and made the new standard. So we say this new generation of firefighting and this new paradigm shift, but really was it us that implemented that? Because I think it's our generations. I mean, we're all about the same age, what, mid thirties, low forties. I think it's us that would kind of set that pace because we were vocal about it. We talked to leadership, we directed and steered that. I don't know. It's, that's what it seems like to me. Well, and we saw, I mean, at least from my experience, like how many people left because those things weren't there. Like it was a consequence of like, you know, this attrition that we're dealing with now is like, oh shit, we need to give people more time off. Like we need to, you know, understand like how taxing this is mentally, emotionally, you know, on families, on, on significant others. And like, you know, I'd like to think, yeah, we were ahead of the curve, but I don't think we were. I think, you know, the last four years have been catch up of like, yeah, oh shit, we kind of fucked things up for, yeah. you know. But it's and, shit that we brought up. Though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, but hopefully, yeah, like we can smooth things out going forward. And like, I know for me, like a rule that I have with my wife is like, we try and take one trip a summer in the middle of the summer to try and actually have a summer. And we've been doing that for a while and it's still uncomfortable every year when I have to go and ask for a week off in July, you know, and like, yeah. And that's, that's just like a personal thing. But if, if my guys ask for a week off, I'm like, yeah, do it. Go for yeah. it. And, yeah. and no like, that's, yeah, it's not even an issue, but you know, like just cause of the way, like, you know, the, the culture was, it's like, my boss doesn't really care, you know, we'll figure it out. But like, cause they, they, Matt, they care about that too. But yeah, just the idea of, having to do it, it's swallowing my own ego and pride. And then as a supervisor, when, you know, I was running engines, I didn't like to take off time because if I took off, then my crew members didn't get the money. Yeah. Yeah. And that was my biggest issue. You have an obligation to them, almost like a contract. Like you're here for the six months, you know, you, you know, you tell me what you want to see and I do my best to make that happen. Yeah. And it's still, I didn't, I didn't mind if they took off, but I had a problem with myself taking time off just for them. Yeah. 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 And that's a good point. It is a struggle. Like, you know, even, yeah, like, man, I'd really like to have that one extra day off, you know, like if we're working six and one and they, they want us to pick it up, but like knowing that those folks, you know, only have a six months max to, to make their money and, and everything like that's, yeah. And that's the hardest part about moving up. Like at least I, I, maybe it is better as a BC, but yeah. you know, <laughs> like, as an engine captain, it sucks. Like, you know, like having to, uh, you know, decide between like your work-life balance and putting your folks, you know, For best sure. interest ahead. So. Yeah. I think it's no matter what, it's always a struggle. Like I'm one of those BCs, uh, oh, the guy sneakily like, okay, I'm going to run your truck today. Yeah. You ain't going <laughs> to like what I do to it, but I'm going to run the truck. <laughs> I may break that shit. But yeah, like if the dudes need, need to take a day, but man, for years, like I don't have time to take off. Like, no, we got a plan. Like, like, I think that's awesome that you take a week off every year. Like, I should try that, but I'm pretty sure, like, I, like, won't. You're too much of a busybody. You're going to yeah. get stir crazy. Well, it's it's just, it's been engraved in my head for so many years. And that's what the culture is, like, yeah. drilled into you, right? Yeah, I got to make money between this month and mm-hmm. this month, and that gets you through. Like, yeah. Yeah, I've worked year-round since I started, but boom, those are the days that you got to go make money. Yeah. yeah. And so, it, it's hard to break that after so many seasons like yeah for sure but i'm really good at saying yeah you want to take it off yeah yeah Yeah, but you're not taking care of yourself in the long run well you're taking care of yourself but maybe not during the summer yeah taking those opportunities like but telling the boys like when i just got a text this morning from one of the guys like hey after our weekend 401 can i take a couple days off yeah i don't care dude you know (laughs) go for it (laughs) yeah like why are you asking like you know my answer yeah we'll figure it out yeah back in for staffing yeah like Oh, well, you're going to miss a couple of days. Like there's any shit going on, man. It's, yeah, it's, yeah, and it's early. Everyone's getting geared up, ready for the seasonals to come on. And, but like he's going through the 401 program, which is all the college crap with me. So like, I get it, man. Like you want to take before the season starts to take and just reset. Like, yeah, take a breather, man. Yeah. Like there's nothing against doing that. Yeah. And I think that's the good direction we're going is that workforce transformation, you know, with the fire and the fuels program is, 
you know, my truck sits three. If I'm down a guy, truck's down. Yeah. Well, I can grab somebody from fuels and say, hey, are you available to staff for these five days? I got somebody that's going to take a vacation, you know? And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Should, yeah. I'd love to jump on an engine and do some mobile attack, you know? Like, yeah. oh, sweet. Go put out a single yeah. tree on the top of wherever. It's, oh, it's yeah. fun shit. Oh, yeah, exactly. You know, so I think that's where that push is. We're, you know, like like we were saying is we might have been behind the curve a little bit, but we're getting caught up. Yeah. Yeah. So. So last year I, I took my week off with my wife. We went to Denver for like six days and, uh, there was a guy from the state office I was covering for me and, uh, you know, it was supposed to be yeah, five days and then he ended up in Elko on severity for two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> so, but he was stoked and, you know, the, the engine got out. So it was awesome. But yeah, it was just kind of funny. Like, you know, it can be, Hey, come over for five days. Like, Oh, actually we're going here. So or hopefully you're good for 14. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad you brought up that point, though, because I think a lot of people don't talk about that, especially like from a leadership perspective, is that sacrifice you have to make because you do have to. It's it's like the untalked about thing. It's like when you become a supervisor of some sort, any sort, right, you do have to keep your your crew's best interests in mind. And that requires a sacrifice from the captains, man. I mean, you have to fill in those gaps and yeah, you got to make their money, especially the seasonals. Man. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up because, like, yeah, that it never comes up in a talk like conversation, really. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, shout out to my wife for, you know, putting up with your shit, putting up with my shit and putting <laughs> sometimes like, you know, guilty, put work first, you know, yeah. um, we all that, do. We're all guilty. It's yeah. part of the culture, man. Yeah. And I, you know, I feel like, you know, that's just me doing my job and serving my guys a purpose for why they're there and why I'm there too. So, yeah, that's awesome, man. But uh, I know you guys got to get out of here pretty soon. So I'm going to wrap this thing up, but I uh, just want to say thank you guys for coming in and showing the, uh, the ropes for the uh, BLM Nevada engine program. And uh, if you guys had any like tips on hiring or anything like that, I know you guys mentioned that a couple of times about hiring. So if you guys got any tips or tricks for like a last, last little note yeah. there. Yeah. So, I mean, what I would, you know, plug for all of ne Nevada would be um, in V fire info uh, org. Um, so that's, you know, what we're trying to use as kind of our one-stop shop for, uh, you know, everything, fire information, um, you know, career information, uh, you know, any kind of resume application guidance. And uh, you can go on there, you know, if, if you are interested in fighting fire in Nevada, it's, you've never fought fire or, you know, you're in another state and you just want to kind of get an idea of what BLM Nevada is about. You can go on there, click contact a recruiter um, and schedule a time and, you know, more than likely it'll be me, uh, Chris Weaver calling you and just having a conversation and seeing, you know, what's going to be the best fit for you within the state or within our programs and, um, trying to help set you up for success. Um, you know, put you in touch with one of the districts, if that's going to be the best, or if it's one of the crews or whatever, and, and just really, um, you know, help move the program forward from a statewide perspective. So, oh yeah. Anybody else got anything to add? My one thing, you know, is don't be afraid to show your face. You know, those district office doors are open Monday. The old through, school approach. Yeah. Face Monday time. through Friday, go to that front desk and say, hey, I want to fight fire. They call one of us up there and we'll have that conversation with you. Well, if you're in Vegas, don't go to the, don't go to the district office. Just drive out to Red Rock. Because <laughs> that's I'm a cool station drive. out there, dude. Yeah. That's a cool station. It is. It's awesome. I, just, I just won't drive to the district office. <laughs> it's too far. Too much traffic. I can fight that. You come to the station. The old topic of how ops people avoid the state office like a plague. Yeah. <laughs> district office. So, oh yeah. I hate going there. Yeah. I just want to put out there, you know, now is not, or now is no better time to get into fire with our career GS fours. I know these 18, 19, 20 year olds aren't thinking about retirement. You need to be, but fire retirement is one of the best out there. And if you get in, get your foot in the door, get that career 18, 19, 20, you're retiring at 45. Yep. And a lot of people don't think about that. Yep. I'll be out at 45, young enough to start a whole other career. Like yeah. That, you can double dip. Yeah. Double you know, parking, son of a bitch. Yeah. I have to wait. I have to wait till 49. <laughs> but yeah. 50 though. And I'm out. Yeah. So <clears> just, just cool. definitely think about that. That's not a lot of time, man. Like from when I started fire, I mean, I'm almost 40 years old now. I mean, I, I, I practically blacked out. That's like a blink of the eye. If I could retire at 40, dude, that'd be awesome. Or 45 even that's not very far away i'd still be fine fit for duty i can go work somewhere else if i wanted to mm -hmm. but yeah yeah you're Pretty not like washed up and broke like busted or anything like that 
one of the other things we're working on, I know or Las Vegas has it, and then Reno's starting to uh, implement it at one of the high schools here is a fire science program, yep. uh, a combination of structure and wildland. And then that's pretty bitching. Um, yeah. You know, the hope would be, you know, at least uh, for the program here in Reno, like we can set them up so that if they want a career seasonal job, like basically out of high school, you know, we've put them on that path. And then, yeah, I mean, retire at 43, like, yeah, that's crazy, you know, like, and these kids are, these kids are buying into it, you yeah. know, like, yeah, when we go in to help teach those classes, those, you know, the teacher doesn't really get it. Like he's been exposed maybe, or like more on the structure side he's is, but yeah, they're used to big red. Yeah. And yeah. then we come in and they're like, what are, what are you? The Why do you kids, have a beer? Yeah. You have a beer. And the kids <laughs> buy into it, man. Why like do you smell? <laughs> yeah. They can't grow facial hair yet, but they're like, I want that. I'm like, okay, well, yeah. come do my job. Well, yeah. think about the like hey, life benefits. Not everybody of fire. can, right? Yeah. <laughs> think about the, the like the development benefits of fire, though. You like rapidly accelerate maturity in some regard. I mean, you do kind of make fart and dick jokes in the woods with like 20 of your best friends at the end yeah. of the day. But I mean, as far as like maturity, as far as like figuring shit out, being self-sufficient, I mean, it's fires made me who I am today. And I'll take some of the lessons I've learned in fire for the rest of my life and I'll use them and apply them somewhere. Right. It's made me who I am today. And I think that's something that's a good selling point to these young folks that are trying to get into fire is that it's going to make you more mature. It's going to make you responsible. It's going to like push you towards a direction that's going to be very beneficial to your life. Maybe I'm biased. Because I have firsthand experience and that's what my belief is. But I don't know. What are you guys' thoughts on that? I think you hit the nail on the head, man. I mean, at first when you start, it might feel like you're drinking through a fire hydrant. Yeah. You know, getting all this stuff thrown at you. That's like the metaphor we like to use when we bring on our seasonals. But, you know, it's it's all about being in the moment, retaining yeah. what you can and, and asking questions. And doing cool so, shit. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Nobody in the office or nobody in this job will have any problem with answering a question. Like mm -hmm. literally no such thing as a stupid question, unless it's something that I already just told you. Yeah, and three you, seconds ago. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but you know what I mean? But I think nobody in this room, nobody in the state would, you know, you could, everybody's approachable. Yeah. So that's what I just respect the most about Nevada BLM. Hell yeah. Well, guys, we're rolling to the end of the show. Definitely want to say thank you once again. I appreciate all you guys being on here and telling uh, the world about the Nevada engine programs. And yeah, it's definitely changed me. It's definitely been a fun time working with a lot of you guys. So it's been fun. But at the end of the show, I always give the opportunity for shout outs to homies, heroes, mentors. Start it off, man. You know, I just, everybody that's still doing the job, everybody in this room, you know, including you for doing your time. Um, you know, everybody that's still grinding, grinding through asses and elbows all the way through, man. Mm -hmm. um, rocky times, but you know, we're getting through it. There's light at the end of the tunnel. I'm Grass super optimistic. Baby. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, you know, hang in there and keep doing the good, good work and keep fighting the good fight. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I want to say thanks, man. Like, I'm, I think it's cool you got us in here, but you're like talking about fire and you're trying to get more people to understand it. I think that's great. Uh, hi, mom. Um, <laughs> um, got to throw that one for the homies, right? But uh, yeah, you know, like for being in Nevada my whole career, like I wouldn't want to call anywhere else home. Like, yeah. This is home. Uh, made some good friends along the way. And yeah, man, like I thought it was a good, it's been a good week. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Except losing to fuels people. Yeah. Boom. <laughs> Come on, Lebowski. You're over the line. I know. <laughs> yeah. Donnie. At least, at least they were from Elko. <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys got nothing else to do out there, yeah. so it's no surprise. <laughs> Just kidding. <too. laughs> um, yeah, thanks for bringing us on. Uh, I think this fire program's headed in the right direction from the top down. Um, yeah, there's a reason I've been in the state and for 18, 18 summers, it's not just because I grew up in Elko. Because you can't find a way out of the county line. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody's told me how to quit yet. <laughs> no, man. Too deep. <laughs> you're, committed. Yeah. you're committed. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, I think the biggest thing, you know, I just want to pass on, you know, for anybody listening is like, make sure that... Uh, if you're interested, get in contact with folks, but if you're in the job and just know that there's always folks there to talk to, whether it's, you know, personal, you know, professional, whatever it might be, just make sure you know how to reach out and, uh, and talk to those. And if you haven't talked to your friends in a while, or your homies, just, yeah, give them a shout and check in. Cause man, that's, uh, something I've learned over the last couple of years is really important, both for myself and others. But, uh, 
yeah, and just to plug it again, if if you're interested in uh, talking with anybody about BLM Nevada, nevadafireinfo.org, and we'll uh, be happy to chat with you. So thanks. Oh, yeah. Well, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Let's move on to the next one. Thank you. Yep. Thanks. Yep. thanks. Later, guys. And boom, there we go, ladies and gentlemen. Another episode of the Anchor Point Podcast is in the books with my good friends, Austin Lee out of Winnemucca, Truett Anderson out of Ely, Elliot Krinka out of Elko, and Chris Weaver out of the Carson City District BLM in the state of Nevada here. Guys, thank you so much for being on the show and sharing your insight and uh, guess uh, shedding a light on to some of the little things that the uh, Bureau of Land Management does here in Nevada with the engine program. One of those things that are pretty damn unique is that hover fill operation. That's, uh, yeah, yeah, I've done it a ton of times. It's really effective. Yeah, it's super cool. But if you uh, have some uh, info that you want to be answered well you can reach out to those folks i'll uh, drop some information in the uh, show notes and like uh i believe that was a uh, krinka saying that but if you want to find out more go to nevadafireinfo.org and you can get a wrap on everything blm fire it's pretty awesome so Hope everybody's doing well. Hope everybody's geared up and ready to get some for the uh, 2023 season. It looks like it's uh, off to a mediocre start, but we'll see what the uh, future holds. I know we don't have a uh, crystal ball, but I wish we did. But then it wouldn't be fun. Anyways, special shout out to our sponsors. We've got Mystery Ranch, makers of the finest damn packs in the fire game. Go over to www.mysteryranch.com and check out the Backbone series. You got until the end of this month, May 31st, 31st, to submit your story to get one of those $1,000 scholarships. We've got the ass movement, my boy Booze, running the ass movement, the anti-surface shooting movement. Get uh, 10% off your entire order over at www.thefirewild.com and check out the ass movement while you're there. And anchor point ass 10 is the code that you're looking for at checkout. So we have Hotshot Brewery, of course, purveyors of kick ass coffee for a kick ass cause. If you want to uh, go get some swag or some coffee or some other tools of the trade to get your morning started off right, go over to www.hotshotbrewing.com and check it out. And then last but not least, not really a sponsor, but I totally love her mission. We've got the wildfire experience, the American wildfire experience, AKA the smoky generation. So if you have a story, if it's compelling, submit your story. You have an opportunity to win one of those $500 grants to tell your story. Pretty awesome. Go to www.wildfireexperience.org and check it out. Y'all know the drill. Stay safe. Stay savage. Peace. Peace.